The Philadelphia Church of God presents The Trumpet Daily. Recently in the Trumpet Weekly, we featured an article that uh, Peggy Noonan wrote for the Wall Street Journal um, sometime back, a few days ago, I guess a couple of weeks ago now. And she was just talking about some of the things that uh, she had noticed in the headlines that were breaking through, as she said, uh, and making the front pages of uh, of our newspapers. And the article's titled, America's Crisis of Character, and the subtitle under it reads, The nation seems to be on the wrong track, and not just economically. It seems to be, in her view, and she brings up quite a few examples, um, talking about all the stories that have broken through, uh, have been very disturbing. She writes, a tourist is beaten in Baltimore. Young people surround him and laugh. He's pummeled, stripped, and robbed. No one helps. They're too busy taping it on their smartphones, she says. That's how we heard their laughter. The video is on YouTube along with the latest McDonald's beatdown and the latest store surveillance tapes of flash mobs. Later she writes, that's just the young you say? Juvenile delinquency is as old as history. Let's turn to adults. Also starring on YouTube this week was the sobbing woman. She's the poor traveler who began to cry. Great heaving sobs when a transportation secretary administration agent at the Madison, Wisconsin airport, either patted her down or felt her up, depending on your viewpoint and experience. Jim Hoft of thegatewaypundit.com recorded it, and like all the rest of the videos, it hurts to watch, she says. It hurts to watch it. There's the GSA scandal, an agency devoted to efficiency is outed as an agency of mindless bread and circuses indulgence. They had a four-day regional conference in Las Vegas with clowns and mind readers. The reason that the story is new, she says, and actually upsetting, is not that a government agency wasted money. That is not news. (laughs) The reason it's news is that the people involved thought what they were doing was funny and appropriate. In the past, bureaucratic misuse of taxpayer money was quiet. You needed investigators to find it, trace it, expose it. Now it's a big public joke, she says. It's just a big joke. All the workers looked affluent, satisfied. Only a generation ago, earnest, tidy government bureaucrats were spoofed as drudges and drones. Not anymore. Now they're way cool, immature, selfish and vain, but way cool. There's the Secret Service scandal. That one broke through too, she says. And you know the facts. Overseas to guard the president, sent home for drinking, partying, picking up prostitutes. What's terrible about this story is that for anyone who's ever seen the Secret Service up close, it's impossible to believe. The Secret Service are the best of the best. That has been their reputation because that has been their reality. They have always been tough, disciplined, and mature. They are men, and they have the most extraordinary job. Take the bullet, she says. Take the bullet. In any presidential party, the Secret Service guys are the ones who are mature, who you can count on, who will keep their heads. They have judgment. They're by the book, and unless they have to rewrite it on a second's notice, and they wore suits like adults. She goes on and talks about just how sloppy so many of them look today when they're traveling the world. She says in New York City, another example, the past week a big story has been about 16 public school teachers who can't be fired even though they acted unprofessionally. And she goes on and talks about what unprofessionally means, all kinds of sexual misconduct at the school, even involving students. But, you know, they're hired on and they can't be fired for some reason. The kids in the flash mobs, she says, these are their teachers. Finally, finally, she writes, as this column goes to press, the journalistic story of the week, the Los Angeles Times decision to publish pictures of the U.S. troops in Afghanistan who smilingly posed 
with the bloody body parts of suicide bombers. The soldier who brought the pictures to the Times said he was very concerned about what he said was a breakdown in discipline and professionalism among the troops. She concludes here, in isolation these stories may sound like the usual sins and scandals, but in the aggregate they seem like something more disturbing, more laden with implication, don't they? And again, these are only from the past week. She's just recounting some of the things she read over the past seven days. And you can pretty much do that now, just about every week. You can go right down the list of these disturbing headlines. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 45. Jeremiah 45. And as you turn over there, I'll read to you the uh, surprising conclusion to this story, this piece that really is quite effective in highlighting what is going wrong. But notice how the article concludes. She says, the leveling or deterioration of public behavior has got to be worrying people who have enough years on them to judge with some perspective. And then finally she says, something seems to be going terribly wrong. Maybe we have to stop and think about this. And that's how the article ends. <laughs> something seems to be wrong here. And maybe we should stop and think about it. Is that it? Is that all that we're to conclude from these horrible headlines? The very fabric of American culture is unraveling before our eyes, and yet the best that even our most clear-thinking commentators can conclude is that something might be wrong and that we ought to pause and think about it. And of course we know that God has a much stronger conclusion a much stronger opinion about what we ought to be doing, about what's wrong and why it's going wrong, and where it's headed, and what we should do. Jeremiah 45, look at verse 2. This is the example of uh, Baruch. I've used this example a number of times before. It says, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, unto you, O Baruch, you did say, Woe is me now, for the Lord has added grief to my sorrow, I fainted in my sighing. I find no rest. He had given uh, quite a lot of his life in service to God's work, in helping Jeremiah. And Judah, the nation of Judah, was falling apart right before his eyes. And yet, here he was, getting depressed and discouraged, thinking about himself. It's easy to do. Even when it's bad all around us, it's still easy to just turn inward, isn't it? Verse 4 says, Thus shall you say unto him, speaking of Jeremiah, saying this to Baruch, The Lord says thus, Behold, that which I have built I will break down, and that which I have planted I will pluck up. Even this whole land, and what God told Jeremiah to tell Baruch, is basically to remind him of the mission that God had given to his prophet and to his work. It's, it's nearly a word-for-word -word reminder of Jeremiah 1 and verse 10. This is why we're here. Don't lose sight of that, Baruch. Don't turn inward. Verse 5 says, And seek you great things for yourself. Seek them not, God says. For behold, I will bring evil upon all flesh, says the Lord. But thy life or your life will I give unto you for a prey in all places where you go. He said, look what's happening. and It's going to get worse. Evil is going to come upon all flesh. And you better get your mind off of yourself. He was losing sight of the vision of the commission that God had given to Jeremiah. And uh, for so many years, Baruch was right there assisting, helping, supporting. Let's look at Jeremiah 1, that verse I mentioned, where God uh, gave Jeremiah, the prophet, his commission to pull down and destroy and then to build up and to plant. Baruch knew that Judah was very near to the point of captivity and ruin. He knew that Judah was near 
to the point of just absolute total ruin, that its sickness was just that bad. And yet even at that time, he was thinking about you know, his needs, what he wanted to do. And that's what you see in America. You're, you're beginning to see people who see what's happening and know something's wrong. But still, we're so selfish. We've turned inward. We're so into our own things that most people won't really do anything when they read a story, a piece like what I quoted at the start. It's just the same old, same old. They've seen it before. And maybe it just gets a little bit worse than it was previously. But there's not very many people, really, who are prepared to act and to do something more than to just think about this for a while. That it might be bad, it might be wrong, something might be wrong. Jeremiah 1 and verse 10 says, See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down and to build and to plant. So God always has a work. Even when nations are falling, even when nations are being destroyed from within, God has a work. In verse 11, he talks about what... Uh, Jeremiah should be looking for. What do you see? He says to Jeremiah. Verse 13 again, And the word of the Lord came unto me the second time, saying, What do you see? And I said, I see a seething pot, and the face thereof is toward the north. Two times here in just a few verses, God asked the prophet, What do you see? And you can see a similar question as this in quite a few scriptures in the Old Testament. Amos 8 and verse 2, I'll just read it to you. You can look at it later. God said to Amos, what do you see? What is it that you see? You can look at Zechariah 4 and verse 2 as well. Same thing. Same question posed to another prophet. What see you? What do you see? God wanted these prophets to be aware of what was happening and then to go and to proclaim God's truth, God's warning message. My father wrote this in the Jeremiah booklet we produce. He said, unless we see what God sees, we can't do his work. We can't deliver a message we do not see. Eloquence is not the top priority. It's a matter of what we see. There are some commentators that are very articulate, some speakers that are very eloquent in describing what's happening. We read them, we lean on them, we quote them quite often. But students, it's not enough to merely com uh, conclude that something might be wrong here or that we need to think about these things. God wants you to see what he sees. He wants you to see where this is leading. He wants you to know what's coming. He wants you to prepare for what's ahead. Mr. Armstrong, Herbert Armstrong wrote back in 1976, he uh, had a coworker letter about what was uppermost in God's mind. I mean, the thing that God is thinking about most, what is it that's his objective, his main objective for each day? What is it that he concentrates on, that he thinks on all the time? Mr. Armstrong said, there is no more central, pivotal passage in the Bible than this. And then he goes on to quote Acts 3, verses 19 through 21, where it says that, that uh, we must repent and be converted. That your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things. And Mr. Armstrong goes on to describe how restitution there means a restoring of something that had been taken away. It's about the kingdom of God being established on earth. God's government being restored to this earth. God's government that was taken away after the rebellion of Lucifer and his angels. That's going to be restored. That's going to be uh, put back on this earth at the return of Christ. Let's look at Luke 21. Switch over to the Gospels here. See what Jesus Christ had to say about the days that are approaching. This is what is uppermost in God's mind. The establishment of God's kingdom on earth, God's family government, on earth. That's what God thinks on daily. That's what God is preparing us for daily. 
That's what God thinks about when he sees all of these disturbing headlines. There is hope for this world. It's not the hope that most people think on. But there is hope. It's revealed in God's word. Luke 21 and verse 32. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Now that's speaking of our present generation, those of us living uh, here at the culmination of man's 6,000 years of rule without God's government set up on earth. Man ruling himself under the direction and influence of Satan as the God of this world, as so many scriptures bear out. We don't have time to go through all of them. But Jesus said, this generation is not going to pass away. Time's not going to go on and on and on. Many scoffers and skeptics will say that. It's always been like this. It hasn't. It, has, it hasn't. Prophecies are being fulfilled. Rapid fire, verse 34 says, And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so that the day come upon you unawares, for as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Christ will come, this, this passage tells us. His coming, his return, will happen suddenly and unexpectedly to so many people who are completely unaware of what's going on, even as bad and as disturbing as it is, looking at the headlines. Still, Many people are going to suffer from the Baruch syndrome and turn inward and get selfish and think about themselves, even at a time when we see our nations just falling apart all around us. It shouldn't be a surprise, though, for people who are serving God. It shouldn't come as a shock to God's people, to true Christians who know where this is leading. Verse 36, Jesus says to us, Watch you therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. That's speaking of his, of his coming, his, his return. God says, Watch and pray always so that you can be accounted worthy to be there, to assist Jesus Christ, to help him as the bride of Christ. Don't be burdened down, as verses 34 and 35 bring out, by the cares of this world. There's plenty of distractions to, to uh, lead us astray, to lead us away from God. But God says, look, be sober, spiritually speaking. Don't let the world and materialism or fleshly pursuits get in the way of your dedication to God's work. Be dedicated to the cause. Get your mind on the commission that God's given to his work. Get the focus on God and his work and off of ourselves so that we can assist Christ, so that we can help God, so that we can support his work. And furthermore, Jesus says there in verse 36, watch, watch you therefore, watch what is happening, watch these events, and see how they relate to Bible prophecy. That's what Jesus meant here. He didn't mean just watch. Well, I think it's kind of interesting. This might be serious. Uh, this could be disturbing. Maybe we should think about it. Jesus said, watch world events. And remember what I've told you, what I've prophesied. So that you can know when it's near. Now, unless we're studying our Bibles, unless we're reading the trumpet.com or the literature that this church produces, we won't know what to watch for. We won't understand the significance of these events. But we can know if we watch the way God wants for us to watch. And then, of course, he says there also in verse 36 to pray, to pray, pray earnestly that God would open our eyes to understand what's happening, why it's happening, and where it's leading. Pray for God to give you understanding. Let's look at 1 Peter 4. 1 Peter 4. When we watch this way and see prophecy being fulfilled before our eyes, 
it motivates us, students, to draw closer to God, to dig into our Bibles, to study God's Word, to cry out to God in our prayers, watch and pray, watch and pray. Look at 1 Peter 4 here. Verse 1, it says, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that, that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. We've got to arm ourselves with the same mind that Jesus Christ had and has, the living Christ. What does Jesus Christ think about these events? What, what are the, the significance, or what is the significance of these events? Jesus Christ will reveal that to us, but we've got to do our part. Verse 7 says, but the end of all things is at hand. Be you therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Watch prayerfully. Bring God into your watching of these events. These are significant events. Bring God into it, though. See them as he sees them. My father wrote in the Peter booklet, the fact that Christ's return is so near should change our behavior. The knowledge of Christ's imminent return should make us urgent spiritually. I mean, we are living in terrifying times, and it's only going to worsen in the years just ahead of us. Now is the time more than ever to be motivated to watch and to see what God sees, my father continued, the worst crisis ever is about to give birth to a new and splendid age. There's intense pain, but what a birth. The birth is coming. He says, today the end of all things truly is at hand, so we must take Peter's point to heart. Because time is so short, we must be sober and watch unto prayer. Let's conclude back over in the book of Jeremiah, where we started, Jeremiah chapter 5. Watch unto prayer. Christ's return is nearly upon us, and so be careful to monitor your prayer life, to watch world events, to understand world events under the light of Bible prophecy, and to be sober, and to be strictly careful with our time and with what we do. Verse 14 of Jeremiah 5, Jeremiah 5, verse 14 says, Wherefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, because you speak this word, behold, I will make my words in your mouth fire, and this people would, and it shall devour them. Lo, I will bring nation upon you from far, O house of Israel, says the Lord. It's a mighty nation. It's an ancient nation a nation whose language you know not, neither understand what they say. That's what's coming. As we you know, implode from within, danger is lurking from without. It's going to come from both, inside and outside, the destruction of our peoples, of our nations. That's what is prophesied. That's where this is headed. Now is the time to sound the alarm so that our people know what's coming, even if they ignore it. And many will, verse 20 continues, declare this in the house of Jacob and publish it in Judah, saying, hear now this, hear now this, O foolish people, and without understanding, which have eyes and see not, which have ears and hear not. See, many will ignore it. Many will turn a blind eye to it. Many will cover their ears. Paul in first, I think it's what, first Timothy four or second Timothy four talks about the people wanting to hear smooth things. Isaiah said the same thing in Isaiah 30. This is prophesied. People want a smooth sounding message coming from their religion, their church on Sunday. They want to feel good about themselves. They want to know that there's hope for this nation as it is today. They want to think that the founders or getting back to the constitution can turn it around or that in our heart of hearts, we're really a good people, we're generous, we're givers. That's not what's, the, what's happening. And, and articles like I read at the start prove that daily. This is reality, God says. 
Watch unto prayer. See this world the way I see it. So that you can know what's coming. So that you can be prepared for what's ahead. Mr. Armstrong, back in the 1980s, he wrote an article on, on why God gives us prophecy. What is it for? Most people just ignore it. Bible prophecy. They think it doesn't apply to today. A third of the Bible is prophecy. And they just turn away from it. They just bury their heads in the sand and look for one little uplifting verse on Sunday morning and think that, well, we can be religious and feel good about the future. Why does God reveal so much about what's coming through the pages of his inspired word, through Bible prophecy? The purpose of prophecy is threefold, Mr. Armstrong said. First, it's given in love to encourage people to repent of their sins so that they can escape punishment. God wants us to, to have an opportunity to turn to him as we see things falling apart around us. And then second, it's given for those who don't repent at first, so that when their punishment comes, that's what Jeremiah is talking about here in chapter 5, those who are blind and deaf, so that when the punishment comes, they will then acknowledge their sins and repent toward the God who will then deliver and rescue them. And then third, he says, the third purpose for prophecy, it announces in advance the coming kingdom of God, the wonderful world tomorrow, a time of the restoration of this earth to a condition of prosperity, peace, and abundant well-being. That's what God announces through prophecy. That's the significance of these events that we read of. They're pointing to the imminent end of this age of man and the beginning of God's civilization. On this earth, it's not enough, students, to merely see that something is terribly wrong today. God wants us to see what he sees. He wants us to see it as he sees it and then turn to God in repentance and faith and to begin preparing now in haste for the soon coming establishment of God's holy kingdom. <laughs>